Welcome and thanks for joining us for this edition of Scope. Morobe's coastline village of Labu Butu was dotted with the provincial colors of green, yellow and blue as villagers welcomed stakeholders for the alluvial mining warden hearing. The warden hearing at Maus Makam, facilitated by the Mineral Resources Authority, was to gauge the people's views on the proposed Morobe alluvial mining project. Morobe Alluvial Mining Limited is an initiative of the provincial government who is embarking on a first of its kind alluvial mining operation that will be based at the mouth of the Makam River which is where Labu Butu is. A warden hearing facilitated by the Deputy Chief Warden of the Mineral Resources Authority, Vele Gavu, was held at the Wampar local level government in late May in the presence of Governor Ginson Saono and his team, all staff of the Morobe Alluvial Mining Limited and the Labu Butu community. The company, after applying for a mining lease on the 16th of February 2021, posted the hearing to gauge the people's views as well as answer questions that they may have regarding the 789.77 hectares of land that will be dredged. Before the landowners were given the opportunity to voice their thoughts, Governor Saono explained the reason behind the establishment of the company, saying he aimed to generate internal revenue using Morobe's resources. Now, long history on this country, first mining in Kamapu Morobe province. After 45 years long independence, in other one plus government department or even long mining department long Yumi long, uh, government it told us them all right alluvial mine people involved long end how about you may help him all now only can use in this player easy long only participate long end of alluvial mine people are mine them learn long only Save man na money man na big company, but alluvial man, where little man is that long and how about you may help him all? Morobe Alluvial Mining Limited was established on the 14th of May 2020 and came into full operation with the appointment of Chief Executive Officer Brigitta Pondros on the 18th of January 2021. Mining list number 167 is an application lodged with the Mineral Resources Authority by the Morobe Alluvial Mining Limited. After the warden hearing, the Deputy Chief Warden submits a report to the Mining Advisory Committee for grants of licenses. So Morobe Alluvial Mining Limited can proceed to mine minerals on Maus Makam list 167. Morobe Alluvial Mining Limited plans to lodge a variation of ML application to mine sand and gravel in the near future. While three of the four clans welcomed the development, saying it would greatly benefit their youth and children, the Lunda clan cautioned against environmental damages. Chairman of the clan Guy Kiliki, who is also Morobe's flag designer, emphasized on the need for a feasibility study or an environmental impact statement. Lovable to people, they depend entirely on this uh, uh, Makam River system. You see, all the livelihood of Lavo people, it, it's all on the river system. I mean, you look at the, uh, the marine uh, environment and also you look at the terrestrial life, you know, Antap Long, uh, long Bush and the kind. You know, when they, when they re release all this, uh, what, uh, waste rocks, waste rocks. 
they're going to build it onto the bank and all this. This will affect all these uh, trees, like medicinal plants and all this. An environmental impact statement helps policy makers, community leaders and stakeholders make informed decisions. Compounded with a lack of awareness of the proposed Morobe Alluvial Mine Project, it is feared that locals have been blindsided by promises of a brighter future. Labubutu's Lunda clan chairman Kiliki pointed out a lack of communication between the Morobe Alluvial Mining Limited and members of the community. No awareness, no study, no nothing. So, so I think we have to push for that before, before operation come up, we have, to, we have to push for that. The clan leader further outlined the need for a monitoring system and a social mapping. We worry long on Labu people there, yeah. especially Labu Butu. Especially Labu Butu. Because I, I believe that their life living will dramatically change. You know, just just like just like that. Like me. You know, time operation and on 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 uh, it releases all this uh, silt and sediment and all this and then into the river system and all this it will it will end up in the mangrove. Voicing similar sentiments was John Katu from the Malatu clan, who said the principal and owners of the late tidal basin have always been overlooked. When you look at it, um, government uh, all developer in or recognizing people, uh, principal land on Labu people, yeah. not even on a single toya or one kind, uh, uh, one way or the other uh, service all doing coming plan, not not even zero straight. Which is um, very impressive. I'm sorry, one straight. People are, after all, when we look at it, we're the Labu people, people are contributing um, maybe some billions a year to the uh, economic law of Papua New Guinea. And after all, um, people are not simple, people are very bit out of this law. One of play your farm, one of resource, people are got some land, one of play game out of Pinicia. In response to the lack of studies into potential physical, cultural and environmental impacts, Morobe governor Ginsen Zaunu gave the assurance that all mining requirements will be followed. When we come back, customs ramp efforts to ensure businesses abide by its laws. Welcome back. PNG Customs Services has been ramping up its efforts to ensure that those who do business in PNG comply with laws using the latest in technology. These efforts have led to customs making a recent discovery of one business trying to evade paying the hefty import duty tax on certain alcohol products. In February of this year, the PNG Customs Services seized a container belonging to an importer that had been on their watch list for previous non-compliance. The importer had declared payable tax as 40,000 kina for cargo it declared as water and other beverages. The cargo was later found to be packed full of cartons of alcoholic spirits, 1,864 cartons to be specific. These were worth up to 1,075,311 kina, over a million kina more than what the importer had declared. This was over a million kina in revenue that could have been lost had the container not been checked. This is something that Chief Customs Commissioner David Towe is very pleased with. I want to give thanks to my hardworking team for the, for the job well done uh, with this uh, detection. A detection of significant major fraud on tax revenue due and payable to the government and the people of this country. Especially when the, during these times when the economy is down, especially during these times when uh, trade is uh, uh, depressed, we need importers who are importing, we need companies who are operating in our, in our, in our country to pay the right taxes. The tax itself, so when they, if they want to take the goods, they pay the 
total taxes and they paid a penalty. So they have to pay the tax and 100% of the tax that was evaded. So they have to pay 2 million, 2 million and 60,000 plus. Our lawyers have advised that there are two, two different ways we can, we can deal with the importer. We will recover the revenue, issue the penalty, and recover the revenue, both the penalty and the revenue itself, and we will also prosecute the case for the false declaration. For, for making a false declaration to customs, we will prosecute the case and apply penalties under the Customs Act, under the admin, uh, administrative penalty provisions under section Section 147, under Section 147A um, of the Customs Act, we will apply the penalty, um, the penalty provisions. Under the, under the Customs Act, we will apply, we will prosecute the case. So the importer will be tried in court. If the court finds him or her guilty, he will be charged separately. This bust was largely thanks to the latest technologies that had been employed by the customs services to ensure that it carries out its duties thoroughly and efficiently. The Container Examination Facility, or CEF, as it is affectionately known by customs staff, is a modern marvel. The CEF is used around the world in ports of entry for cargo to screen containers for compliance. PNG purchased the X-ray machine at a cost of 6 million kina, from Chinese manufacturer Naktek. The custom Sefet Motukea was officially opened in 2017. To now unveil the plaque to signify the opening of these facilities, I'm now doing that uh, so that this facility can now be used by our PNG customs. So it's the PNG customs. To PNG customs and of course to our government. The CEF is quite the fascinating contraption. Simply put, it is a drive through for shipping containers. Truck drivers bringing in high-risk containers drive through the facility and park before getting out and retreating to a safe room away from the radio waves of the X-ray machine. Once inside, the driver presses a button that then enables the screening to commence. As a safety mechanism, the screening will not begin until the button is pressed. The whole process takes less than 10 minutes. If suspicious items or items not matching those declared by the importer are detected, the container is then taken to another area where it is opened up and inspected. This process was how the container carrying millions of kina worth of alcohol was discovered. Another way that customs ensures compliance is through the depot arrangement. Under this arrangement, cargoes go to the depot and stay for up to a period of 30 days and must be cleared within the 30 days. Depots are supposed to take in loose container loads, which are containers that carry cargo by multiple importers. When the containers go to the depot, the different multiple importers are supposed to lodge their declarations and have their goods cleared by customs officials, who have to inspect the unpacking of the goods for compliance. This, however, is not happening. That's been happening for over some time. And um, what um, we have done now is to um, uh, look at how best we can address that uh, loss of control of cargo at the depots. So in this, um, in this exercise, what I've um, uh, done is to um, look at uh, uh, increasing the manpower, increasing the manpower at the... Um, in our Compliance Operations Division. Currently, they had only about um, three people, three people, three officers um, addressing the, um, or managing about uh, 10, 10 depots, uh, another eight, eight um, boarded facilities, uh, about um, uh, six, six manufacturing uh, warehouses, manufacturing operations in the NCD. 
uh, that's a significant amount of work that they've been doing. But uh, they did not have the, the number of, of manpower to be able to do that. Because of that um, overloading work, um, I've realized that uh, we, have, we have lost control of cargo accountability. In order to address this dire need for more agents, the PNG Customs Service is now on a recruitment drive to beef up its operations and increase skilled customs agents who will be the frontliners helping to boost revenue collection by enforcing compliance. This month, 10 direct entries were recruited into the service as short-term contractors. This week, the recruits attended a week-long training that took them through their roles and responsibilities. More offices are to be recruited this year. Total overhead count is 1,300 plus. We are currently tracking at uh, less than 50 percent. Our current manpower is almost up to 400, 430, 440. So we still need to recruit a lot more, a lot more people. These 10 people that have come on board will bring us up to 440, and um, we will be um, advertising in the next uh, couple of weeks, where we will bring on board another 20, another 20 people. We have done another recruitment process earlier in the year. And we have brought on board um, another 20 people. Uh, out of the 20, 10 have already joined us, and uh, another 10 are still being uh, uh, interviewed, or, or the interview process, uh, recruitment process is almost uh, uh, near completion. So, in the earlier advertisement, we brought uh, about 20 people. Uh, we have now got on board uh, 10 people under the short term contract arrangement, and uh, potentially another 23. We'll, uh, we will advertise uh, in the form of in the papers, and uh, we hope to bring in another, another 20, so that should give us um, up to 50 new people um, uh, when we complete this uh, recruitment process. And uh, I want to make the call to every uh, importer, every exporter, uh, to ensure that uh, they pay the taxes, they correctly declare uh, their imports correctly declare the exports, um, if taxes apply, uh, whether it be uh, import GST or customs duties, any levies and charges that, um, that apply, uh, every importer and every exporter uh, is requested uh, to ensure that we um, they pay the taxes and um, uh, let's work in partnership. I will not allow, I will not allow any importer who tries to defraud state revenue, who tries to um, breach ca the customs laws, we will ensure to en enforce the customs law uh, as they should be uh, enforced. And uh, every importer, every exporter, every manufacturer of um, excise taxable goods uh, must comply with the law uh, and, and pay every taxes that are payable to the state, to the people of Papua New Guinea. In moving forward, Chief Commissioner Towe said the Customs is working to facilitate fair and legitimate trade and is warning importers who may be considering cutting corners to stay on the straight and narrow. When we come back, the Hunter's Village built in East New Britain province has been revamped and converted into a permanent modern COVID-19 isolation facility. Welcome back to Scope. The old PNG Hunters Village in Kokopo was recently renovated and converted to East New Britain's new permanent modern isolation facility. Since it was built, the building was abandoned and left at the mercy of vandals after the PNG Hunters team was relocated back to Port Mosby after the Pacific Games. Jacob Building Construction General Manager Thomas Gorey said upon the awarding of the contract, they swiftly went straight into the first phase of construction within three months. He said while the original structure was maintained, most of the work was concentrated on replacing the walling frames, refurbishment of the interior, and converting into self-contained rooms with accessories. And I salute the people of East New Britain, together with the provincial government and provincial administration, for 
you know, looking at putting these kind of things up uh, for the people of East New Britain. And uh, this is what we, we get for, you know, using money wisely. And I mean, on, on top of that, they decided to do amazing facilities. And uh, the missing facilities is around the corner, and you can see from here. You know, this this place is done up in a way where you can come in and feel free to go in there and sit down, relax. It's all aircon, everything. Jacom Building Construction have actually contributed a lot uh, in terms of uh, supporting the provincial government. Some of these things that you can see, especially the timber, the ship level in front, that, that is our donation to the provincial government. Uh, the plant is supposed to be a uh, hardy plank, but I've changed that and I told them that because it's a, for the people of New Britain, we have to put something in and it's part of our contribution and we'd like to be part of the development out here and, and I'd like to thank them for looking, uh, I mean, trusting us and giving us the project and, you know, we would like to do more projects so it's all up to, you know, people to see that if we are able to actually look at it, then I'm sure we are ready, we are ready. Gori said Kokopo Isolation Center is the first standalone COVID-19 isolation facility in the country, which included a proper meshing facility and other accessories. He said the center has added a new outlook to the physical development in the province. Whatever you can find in there is just the same as what you can find in Stanley Hotel. And I am proud to say this, I am proud to say this because, uh, you know, as a builder, I know exactly what we've actually put in. Uh, these rooms are self-contained. They have everything that you can think of when you walk into a room in the hotel. Uh, you will not actually miss it and you will not come out of it. Uh, there, we have 36 rooms and uh, we, also, we also have uh, uh, eight, uh, we have also have four, uh, sorry, two uh, uh, office spaces for a nursing, nursing, nursing area. And uh, it's a total of 38 rooms altogether. Uh, and these are self-contained. And uh, they are up to standard. They are class. They are class. Uh, and uh, they, they actually, I mean, they are very inviting. Very inviting. As you walk in fully there, fully air conditioned, fully kitted. As I said, you can walk into Stanley Hotel. You will not actually come out of it. And I know for sure the same thing you can find here in Eastern Britain now. The new isolation center, now called Gunananuvia, or Land of the Overcomers, was officially opened by the member for Esse Allah, David Stevens, who was then the Deputy Prime Minister. Today, in this Land of Overcomers, we have seen a demonstration once again that gives me hope as I go back to Waigani, I know that PNG will still move forward because we have good, strong, resilient provinces like East New Britain. God bless you and God bless Papua New Guinea. As also officiating at the opening ceremony, Provincial Pandemic Controller and Provincial Administrator Wilson Matava and Contractor Thomas Gorey. The isolation facility has now been fully utilised since the recent surge of positive cases in the province. And that ends another episode of SCOPE. A kind reminder to apply simple measures to prevent the transmission of the coronavirus. Regularly wash your hands with soap and water, cough or sneeze into your elbow, and exercise social distancing. If you are feeling sick, please stay at home. You can also call the COVID-19 hotline number for more information or assistance.